Does it feel different to be up there without a rope? It's obviously like much higher consequence. People who know a little bit about climbing, they're like, oh, he's totally safe. And then people who really know exactly what he's doing are freaked out. I've thought about El Cap like for years, and every year I'm like, that's really scary. I'll never be content unless I at least put in the effort. El Cap is the most impressive wall on Earth. It's 3,200 feet of sheer granite. It's the center of the rock climbing universe. Obviously, I get interview questions about it all the time. Oh, would you like to do that? And you're like, yes, for sure. So you're a girlfriend now, I heard. It's awesome. <laughs> Pretty much makes life better in every way. It's really hard for me to grasp why he wants this. But if he doesn't do this stuff, he'd regret it. Everybody who has made free soloing a big part of their life is dead now. I haven't been injured in like seven years. I suddenly start getting injured all the time. What if something happens? <laughs> what if I don't see him again? I could just walk away, but it's like, I don't want to. I've always been conflicted about shooting a film about free soloing just because it's so dangerous. It's hard to not imagine your friend falling through the frame to his death. I think when he's free soloing, that's when he feels the most alive, most everything. How can you even think about taking it away from somebody? No mistakes tomorrow. Starting to get kind of psyched. If you're pushing the edge, eventually you find the edge. I can't believe you guys are actually gonna watch. Hey Jimmy, do you copy? Just started climbing. Super excited to have you guys here today. Delighted to be able to talk to you about free solo and your life and creativity and art and commerce and everything. So welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. It's very nice to be it's here. It's cool. Uh, I'm fascinated by your relationship, both personal and working relationship. Like it's got to be uh, a cool and at times I would imagine challenging dynamic to work together on a creative project or projects that you guys both feel so passionately about. Um, but, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like this is like a divine pairing, like the expertise uh, that you bring, Jimmy, and Shy that you bring creates this beautiful uh, complement, complementary uh, sort of set of skills that allows both of your work to like go to the next level. And I think Free Solo is a perfect example of that. I mean, Free Solo is, a, it is, it is the manifestation of that, yeah. um, along with what Alex brought uh-huh. Um, you always need the good subject. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, but no, I think it's because he brought so much of his craft to El Cap that mm -hmm. it kind of it pushed Jimmy and and that and his high angle team to bring their best and then it pushed Jimmy and I as directors to bring our best. Yeah. Um but I mean yes, the free solo is a very good example or manifestation of how Jimmy our partnership works. Yeah. And um, it's it is like the evolution from Meru also. I feel like climbing movies have been sort of tiptoeing up against the this barrier of trying to break through to mainstream audiences. Um it seems like Valley Uprising was, was a solid attempt at doing that. It didn't quite get the penetration that I feel like it deserved. And then Meru went a long way towards introducing mainstream audiences to this world that you're so passionate about that runs through your blood. Um, but Free Solo is like next level, man. Like people are <laughs> freaking out from this movie. Yes. Uh, no, but I think that you're, you're right that, you know, that cross-pollination, essentially, from Chai's talents uh, and where she comes from and her very strong background the last, what, 15 years of, you know, serious nonfiction documentary work mm -hmm. uh, combined with, you know, what I've, what I've been doing for 20 years. 
And, you know, I think the biggest thing is that there's a lot of trust there. And, you know, sometimes I wonder, you know, I, in some ways our, our, our working relationships on films, uh, on this film, it, it's almost simpler compared to our uh, compared to like being married and having children and uh-huh. all those things because we you know I think it's very easily recognizable like what we each bring to the table on that level and I guess it's 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 similar yeah you know but I mean, it's hard I mean the you're like it was up on this yeah, it bit. was wonderful to bring our children to Yosemite mm-hmm. you know and it was definitely Part of my motivation was keeping everyone together and bringing our children to this wonderful place. But now in this part, right, like you've got both parents on the road and that's hard. Yeah. So it's, they're kind of those very practical considerations that become tough on us as a family. Yeah. Um, but in the work, in the work, it's, it's really, it, it works because Jimmy and I trust each other so much. Like I know he's going to make the right decisions when he's shooting. Uh-huh. He trusts when I'm, I'm asking for something that I'm asking for it for a reason. Um, like, you know, get that shot. Right. Um, and it's really important that we film that. Um, and, it, and it kind of works that way. And like, just even on this film, like they're toiling away on the, on the wall with Alex for eight hours, 10 hours. And then Alex, you know, Alex sits down, but they're still up there kind of, you know, uh-huh gathering the ropes and getting down and you know myself and a different team like a verite cinematographer would be there to talk to alex about life and love and yeah. his dad and you um, need both i mean yeah. jimmy you know on the one hand like you're the only person who could be doing what you're doing you have the climbing expertise and the background and the experience and you have this incredible um, acuity with the camera your cinematographer's eye and then chai you bring the emotionality and the narrative structure to this to really take these extraordinary visuals and turn them into a, a narrative that will connect with people's hearts is that fair i think it's fair yeah. but i think that it's often easy to underestimate jimmy in that particular respect mm-hmm. whereas i think we have a great cheat so to speak where jimmy in, in this one brings such an intimate knowledge of this world. And I often feel like just more of an interpreter uh-huh. um, for like his, his instincts and bring some exteriority to it. Yeah. Um, because what I think what also is strong about the film is it, it looks at Alex's interior life and tries to build a story while also aspiring to be something that the core respects mm-hmm. right like that there's an authenticity that is a hundred percent jimmy yeah you, know? you have to serve two masters right you don't you can't alienate the hardcores but you also have to make it appealing and interesting and compelling for somebody who knows nothing about this world yeah so it has to, it has to make both of us happy which is kind of uh-huh. what that is right yeah yeah like, yeah <laughs> yeah and then and it and it works that way i mean i think she's very accurate about that in the sense that you know a lot of the heart and the soul of both Meru and uh, Free Solo are ideas that, you know, I've experienced or seen or feel deeply about because I've been in this world Mm -hmm. and they're the great lessons or the great conflicts, internal conflicts that I have suffered or people around me in my peer group have experienced. You know, those are ideas that are really the inspiration behind the films, you know, the mentorship and the camaraderie and the friendships that I felt so deeply, uh, you know, that have driven me to make these films. The task though, is that I've never, it's, you're so close to it. It's really hard to translate. And like I said, I mean, Chai has been like the, the great interpreter. She has been able to, kind of stand outside of it and uh, be able to tell that story in a way that every, people can digest it. Right. And that is really powerful because I have not, you know, I, I know it well. And so those are the conversations, mm-hmm. you know, when Chai and I are sitting there in the edit room or when we're making these films, it's, you know, she's just kind of... T- she, you know her first strokes at it are usually very good and then and then we start to kind of refine those things uh and then also making sure you know 
of course it has to also speak to the core. Like, there's no way I'm ever going to put out a film where I can't feel proud walking yeah. into a room full of my peer group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, but I would suspect that from your perspective, Jimmy, you may think you're conveying a certain point because you're so close to it. And Chai can say, yeah, you think you're saying this, but actually I'm not getting it or the average person is not going to understand what you're trying to convey. It's more like that's a wonderful point. It's very important that we achieve this other thing. Uh huh. We get to that other thing, and then I'm like, okay, let's go back to what Jimmy was saying. Right. Um, and see if we can make it work within what we've done. Uh huh. So you're each polishing each other's stones. Yeah. Of. Yeah. Yeah. And well, it's really important. It's like this right. concept that was incredibly important in the film. It's a good example about preserving Alex's experience of the climb. Right. Like that's actually the most important part of the task for for us was to yeah. make sure that Alex enjoyed and got what he wanted out of this. But that is a very elusive idea for uh, people who don't understand climbing. Right. All right. Jim's going to follow you guys down partway. Claire's going to pick you guys up at the bottom of the gully and going into the base. Okay. We'll be shooting on the wall. Jim, so once we pass you guys, you guys wrap and then hike to the summit, basically? Yeah. My, Jimmy and I have worked together for 10 years. I will hike to the top. We've climbed all over the world. We're doing the triple link up, too. We're doing I, know, I know, I know. I mean, by the time we get to Yosemite, we're going to be, as Shane says, yoked. <laughs> <laughs> The team that Jimmy assembled are all professional climbers. The best possible crew for this kind of thing. And so in a way, I'm like, this is kind of awesome. You know, it's kind of just like, I get to go climb with all my friends. Mikey, we should put someone right here, because if you lean out, you can see the entire freaking route. Then let's just put the 100 meter there and the 400 footer here, doubled up. I've known Alex since he pretty much started climbing in Yosemite. 2008 or 9. I've filmed Alex a handful of times, free soloing. And then we've also spent a couple winters together down in South America. So uh, we, the time's added up. I, I spend a lot of time with him now. So I'm scared because I don't want to see anything happen to Alex. I mean, it's one of the reasons I almost said no to this job. I mean, I think Jimmy went through the same stuff of being like, do we really want to be part of this? I've always been conflicted about shooting a film about free soloing just because it's so dangerous. It's hard to not imagine your friend, Alex, soloing something that's extremely dangerous and you're making a film about it which might put undue pressure on him to do something and him falling through the frame to his death. And we have to work through that and understand that what we're doing is something that we can live with even in a worst case scenario. It's an extraordinary accomplishment, this movie. And it's a very delicate tightrope walk because the simple fact that you're present around him uh, inevitably influences him. And that's something you explore in the movie and trying to remain adequately removed so he has the space to do what he does and in the way that he aspires to do it, um, while also trying to, you know, responsibly document it so yeah. you can tell the story. I mean, it's it's you like a Rubik's Cube, you know, you to try to solve head. that. Yeah. And I love how you kind of break the fourth wall with that. I mean, you bring the filmmaker and the filmmaking process into the actual narrative of the movie, and that really elevates the... Um, the compelling nature of the story that you're trying to tell. It's like that physics thing, like the simple observation of, of a subatomic particle is going to you know, change its position in nature, right? And that's a micro example of, of what you are experiencing, just trying to be there. And I don't want to you know, spoil it for people that haven't seen it, but that gets played out you know, in, a, in a pretty interesting way. Yeah. No, I think you, you nailed yeah. it. I mean, it, it's a, a lot also about respect for the craft and the athlete. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, you you as an athlete, I mean, you know um, that you don't want to, like, 
take away from the whole inspiration of the the film, you know, by being there and filming him. Uh, it's always been a conundrum in my field of work, yeah. you know, because especially in climbing and, and probably in, you know, surfing, I mean, there's this whole idea of purity of, right. of the, of why you do it, you mm-hmm. know, and, and we address that too, you know, you see Peter Croft in the film being like, you know, when people asked me if they could film me on Astro Man, I was like, no, nope, not interested. Yeah. You know. And in that moment, Alex lights up like a Christmas tree. You can see the respect that he has for yeah. this guy, and he can really hear what he's telling him. And Alex, you can almost see the gears in his brain turning, like, am I making a mistake? Like, yeah. is this uh, a demonstration of a lack of integrity? Because he, he's like, look, I have a film crew with me. Yeah. Like, how do I do this? And, the, and the, the, the old sage is saying, like, I wouldn't do that. You know, and he's like you can see him like really having a moment of reckoning with that. Yeah. And Peter's like the great, you know, Yoda for all climbers, you know, for he's been the one, like the chosen one for, for generation. Uh And uh, so his, his words weigh heavily for sure. But it was interesting because that decision to include the filmmakers, you know, was a hard one. And it, it was one of those things that we had to, see if we could make it work in a, in a true way on different levels. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and without it. Yes. Yeah. And without it. I mean, um, tried. Oh, you did, you did a cut without that to yeah, see how of that would course. play. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. It, was, it was always about degree with the filmmakers. Right. Like how much do we put in? Like, and also what is it really about? You know? So it's, it's not about the people are interested in how we did it. Right. Like that would be like the clear one reason mm-hmm. why you include them because people want to see these guys hanging on ropes and they're like, how did they do this? How did they do this? It was often a really big question in Meru where we were like, they're like, so what? The fourth person was filming it, and you're like, no, yeah, we're, they were filming themselves. Yeah, but what's relevant yeah. about breaking that fourth wall and bringing the filmmakers into it is this question of purity. Like, what does it mean to do this from uh, you know a pure place of 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 the heart? And and you're Jimmy, you're like struggling with that. Because you have these conflicting uh, drives, right? Yeah. To respect what Alex is trying to do and also to have some fidelity to the creative process of telling an amazing story that will inspire millions of people. And the ethical questions of... The ethical yeah. questions. Really what, is, right. what, yeah. what if yeah. filming him yeah. causes him right. to die? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what that, does that mean? And yeah. what, you're, you're shouldering this incredible ethical conundrum, this burden of being respon- not responsible necessarily, but a participant in something that could be fatal. And that seemed essential to include. Yeah. Because it also gets to the existential heart of the movie itself, right? Because in dealing with that ethical question about how, what is our responsibility in this situation, you have to stop and think about all the worst case scenarios and then think about the reasons why you would make a film like this. Mm-hmm. Like, what is it, is it justifiable? Like, is, is it worthwhile? And, you know, it gets to then that idea of Alex living a life of intention and every day is exactly what he's wanted, what he wants to do. Um, he's thought deeply about his own mortality and his own death and he chooses to do this. Um, and, you know, and for us, that, that, that idea, like a life of intention, makes it worthwhile, mm-hmm. right? Clearly, we thought he would not get hurt. We trusted him deeply. We trusted him to make the right decisions and not to climb. You know, like you see in the film, like he right. decides not to climb. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, you know, including the crew was a way to get there, to talk about this. Um, and also, you know, what is was always been a solo endeavor for Alex. Like he's in a van, he gets up and he goes and does this and no one knows about it. Maybe someone later, you know, reports it on a climbing blog. Um, his greatest free solo of his life ended up being about a connection rather than being isolated. Mm -hmm. You know, he had his best friends next to him for a year and a half training alongside him, giving him feedback, trying to refine their shots while he's refining his moves. Yeah. Um, and all saying, like, we're never going to ask you whether or not you're going to actually climb. And we like you for who you are. You know, you're you, and we're still here. Yeah. Um, and then he had this woman who entered his life 
who for, I think for probably the first time in his life said, I'm going to tell you how I feel about this, but I still love you. Yeah. You know, and I'm not going, I'm going to try not to go anywhere. So I think that it was this weird process for Alex that it became about connecting with people and communing with people, sharing an experience, whereas it always had been just this alone, like loner endeavor for him. Mm-hmm. And the crew was a way of bringing that to life by showing the crew's feelings about this and how they interact with Alex was our way of trying to get to that truth, you know? Yeah. From a psychological perspective, he's such a fascinating person, um, unique and and really funny, you know, that comes across <laughs> really well in the movie. Yeah. Um, in a in a just a quirky, bizarre kind of way. Um and to kind of echo what you said about, you know, the solo pursuit of what he's doing and then and then trying to grapple with the community component of that, the amazing variable is, you know, enter stage left girlfriend, which is like a filmmaker's dream, right? Because that just takes the narrative in a <laughs> yeah. whole new direction and makes it so much more layered and complex and interesting. If it's stuck. Um, if it's stuck, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and to whole share other- <laughs> her perspective, which... I would imagine on some level reflects your perspective being in a relationship with Jimmy, right? Like, what is it like to be in a relationship with somebody who's constantly going out, who's compelled to do these death-defying, you know, adventures? Um, And I also loved how you explored um, Alex's background, particularly his father and what his father struggled with. And I couldn't help but wonder, like, well, what, what, like, remnant of that lives within Alex, like, not that he is, um, you know, has Asperger's or anything like that, but there's something unique about his personality type that makes him perfectly, you know, a perfect fit for what he loves to do. And it was really important to us to explore, like, Alex's origins, like where he came from, and explore his most influential relationships. And, you know, Alex's dad was a really tricky one because, you know, Alex's dad died, I want to say 11 years ago or 12 years ago. Um, He dropped dead in the airport of a heart attack. Um, And his parents had gotten divorced about a year prior to that. And so there was this absence, right? There was no one to speak for Alex's dad who had belayed Alex for thousands of hours Mm -hmm. in this climbing gym and probably didn't say much but showed up and belayed him, right? Like Alex's sister puts it the best, being like, I always wonder if my dad had lived, if he would call and say a sentence about each book he read instead of just telling me the titles. Yeah. This man didn't speak very much. Right. And, but he was very present. So I think there's definitely some, a part of Alex's dad and Alex that probably inc- like inclines him towards what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that what you see of his mom is very interesting. You know, this idea of perfection is clearly, like, from his mother. Yeah. It's weird, though, because I don't get that vibe from her. She doesn't strike me as somebody who's some kind of taskmaster who's, who's like, you know, you have to be perfect. But clearly that's, you know, Alex's recollection or perception of of his upbringing. Well, I mean, she's a published author. She runs marathons. She's a concert pianist. I, I mean... I don't know if she held him. I think she clearly held him to those standards. Like good is and good, good enough isn't. Um, what's the other one? Um, it's good enough isn't is the best one. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also held herself to those standards. Uh-huh. You know, but she grew up in a different time, right? She's a Sacramento teacher, you know, from New York who moved in with this Northern California family. Mm-hmm. As somebody who's not a client, like I'm not a climber. Um, but I've watched a bunch of climbing movies. Um, I've gotten to know some of the climbers, and I know lots of extreme athletes who do crazy things. And I went into the movie, and and I had met Alex, and Alex, you know, sat right where you're sitting and got to know him a little bit. So I went into the movie thinking, like, I pr- I know what this is about. Like, you know, I'm familiar with the story, and I, I get it. And you know, it didn't take very many minutes into the movie where I, until I had this dawning epiphany, like, oh, I don't understand this at all. You know, like, I, this is, like, way more complicated and intense and hardcore <laughs> than I could have ever imagined. And Tommy kind of says it in the movie. He's like, um, 
you know, people think, oh, yeah, he's going to free solo. That's what he does. Like, I just thought, like, you know, he's just he picks these routes and he just goes up. And it's the climbers who really know, who have the great appreciation for just how super gnarly the whole thing is. And the diligence and the preparation, the attention to detail and the focus that he demonstrates, like that montage where you have the voiceover of him reading from his diaries and you're like, he has every maneuver completely devoted to memory all the way up this wall. And it really boils down to those three or four tricky moves to make it work for him. No, absolutely. I, I mean, I think I, I I know it's really almost impossible for a non climber to imagine the scope of the difficulty because it's hard for a professional climber. It's hard for me to understand even how difficult it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's truly beyond what you know, we were even talking about. It wasn't something that climbers were sitting around the campfire talking about, you know, Um, because it wasn't just, it just wasn't even on the radar of Uh possibility. It's just so far out there. Uh, And, you know, I've been filming and and shooting in this space for 20 years and, and worked with many of the best, you know, Peter Croft included, Dean Potter and and many other incredible Conrad. athletes and people, Conrad, mm-hmm. at the peak of their careers um, and some of their top achievements. Also in the ski mountaineering world and, and snowboarding and, you know, just a lot, right. a good mix of extreme athletes. And I just haven't seen anything like it. You know, when, when Alex came on the scene, and he kind of came out of nowhere, uh, when when I first heard about him soloing Moonlight Butcheress and Half Dome, I mean, honestly, I, I, you know, didn't believe it. I was like, there's no way somebody just showed up and did that. You thought it was just apocryphal or somebody made it up? Or? Yeah, uh-huh. kind of. You know, I had to, I did, I dug. I was like, no way. There's no way. And, and El Cap is you know, several magnitudes more difficult than Half Dome, like many more. Uh Uh, It's just so much more difficult. And I I, I don't know if there's a good way to put it, but I mean, it's like, you know, I think about in the world of running like a marathon, it's like people are talking about that person that's going to break the two hour barrier, right? And then someone shows up and runs a marathon in under an hour. Uh-huh. You know, where everybody's like, what? It's that, it's that crazy. Yeah. You're like, what? Who's, who's talking about running a marathon under an hour? Yeah, right? it's, it's not physically possible. Well, that's... So we, so we believe, I guess. So we believe. Right? Yeah. And so for, uh, you know, to imagine somebody, it's just, it's a combination of not necessarily physically possible, but it's just mentally there's no way someone mm-hmm. could keep it together like that. It's just unimaginable. Um, so when, how does this all come together? At some point, Alex had to be declarative, like, I'm going to do this, right, to at least you know, get you guys in motion and thinking about the idea of doing a movie on this. Yeah, well, I, 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 it's a funny story. It's a great story, is it? Because, you know, Chai and I were talking about different potential films after Meru uh, and, and a few people had been approaching us. And so we kind of thrown it out there that we were going to, we were thinking about making a film about Alex, but it was more of a character portrait, you know, character study right. of Alex and all, his achievements up to before Al Cap were already worthy of, you know, mm-hmm. an incredible film. And so I've been climbing and filming and, traveling with Alex for 10 years and know him pretty well, but Chai didn't know him as well. So she wanted to spend some time with him and he came out to New York and I was on another project out of the country or out of, out of the state, but, uh, she was spending time with Alex. He came to stay with us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which in itself is a great story, but we'll leave it at that. Um, what? Come he, on. No, you can't, can't say I that. Can't, I can't. We had, <laughs> oh. He wasn't alone. Let's put it that way. All right. <laughs> he wasn't okay. alone. Um, 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 to my great surprise. And, um, but it was over breakfast that he 
basically just came out with it and said, I, I'm thinking about free soloing El Cap, mm-hmm. and if there's a movie, it should be about that. And, and Chai's like, oh, that sounds great. Like, right. As a filmmaker, I was like, okay, okay, <laughs> yeah. that sounds amazing, great, that's big. And then I told Jimmy, and I think I was the first person Alex ever said it to out loud directly. Um, and I told Jimmy, and you were like, no way, like, too risky, we can't do it. I was like, he didn't say that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was like, there's just no, he did, he said what? You know, I made her repeat herself like multiple times. Because I'm like, he's never said it to me. He's never said it to anybody I've known. And obviously we're very conscious of it. Because, yeah. you know, all of his friends in the back of our minds, you know, we, we didn't even want to think about it. But back there we kind of could tell like everything he had been doing has been leading towards a mm. particular direction. Mm-hmm. And the end of that path there's a giant 3000 foot wall you know right <laughs> and so unimaginable but, and set against yeah. the backdrop in which a lot of sponsors are you know dropping these athletes because yeah. the risk factor is sure. so high and it's just too trepidatious for you know a brand to be involved in something that could lead to a fatality, right? Yeah. Cliff dropped all the yeah. people who sold As opposed to race car driving, right? Right. <laughs> those cars flip all the time, though. For the most part, those guys seem to walk away. I don't know how that works, but... <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, so, so, all right, so you're like, there's no way, right? So your initial, your impulse was, I can't, we can't make a movie, we, we can't be involved in this, or you just didn't believe that it was more, he was actually going to do this? Let's... Let's take a step back here for a moment and really think about this. Let's, let's, we have to answer some very hard questions. You know, mm-hmm. is this ethical? Do we trust him? Do we trust that we're able to do a production around this without, you know, causing him harm? Uh, is he, is the production going to, you know, the external pressure of the production going to push him to do something he wouldn't want to do, wouldn't normally do, you know, just mm-hmm. a lot of those questions. And, and I, there's a couple months where I just tried to shut it down and, and stop thinking about it, but you know, people were interested. And so we had to kind of make a decision. Uh, and I think six months into the process, Chai and I were hanging out with, uh, John Krakauer and, you know, the author, and he's a very good friend and mentor, really. And, uh, you know, we kind of dropped it on him. It was even hard to say. It's like, hey, um, because he was like, what are you guys thinking about next? And we were like, we're thinking about a film on Alex. He's like, oh, that would be a great film. And we were like, well, he's thinking about soloing El Cap. And I remember we were walking down the sidewalk and he stopped and he looked over and he's like, what? <laughs> you know, cause that uh, John gets it. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Like, yeah, he's, he's thinking about soloing El Cap and, you know, John took a minute to absorb it. But then I was like, well, what do you think? And he just looked at us and he's like, well, is he going to do it anyways? And we were like, yeah, probably, you know, He's like, you've been filming with him for 10 years. You know him as well as anybody. This is what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, do you trust anybody else to do it? Mm -hmm. No, you're the only team that could, that could, if he is going to do it anyway, that kind of answers the ethical dilemma aspect of it. But then I would imagine, yeah, you're like shaking your head, right? I mean, it doesn't let us off the hook. It it doesn't let you off the hook. But I would imagine that there was then a lot of conversations about what the ground rules would be for how you would capture this. Yeah. Yeah. We had to build guidelines Uh for ourselves. So what does that look like? Um, Well, I mean, the the most poignant one is like one could never ask Alex if he was going to free solo a cap, Uh if he was ready, if he was going to go, any of it. Um, and if you just stop and think about what that looks like, that's kind of, I mean, it's a staggering for a documentary film. Yeah. Like you've got how many people waiting every day in place, ready to go. Your burn rate being yeah. very high. Right. Cause that was the other thing too. I just, I just, I guess I just assumed that. 
there would be a date on the calendar and that mm. that was going to be the day that he was going to do it and everybody would be ready. And it's not, it's like, no, well, he, he could just, you know, do it whenever, whenever the moment, whenever he them, felt yeah. inspired to do it, when he felt in his soul that he was ready, that it would just happen. And you had to be on standby the whole time. Yeah, it was an open timeline. How long did that go on for? It felt like forever. <laughs> <laughs> You're just like living in Yosemite. Like, is he going to do this? Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously we, we were seeing him train mm-hmm. and we could tell, you know, where he was in his kind of fitness program. I mean, the other thing that's like amazing, and I think that people take for granted is that there's no coach for this. Right. There's no diagram for how you train best for f- free soloing El Cap. I mean, he invents it himself. And so, you know, we're also friends and climbing partners. So he's explaining like how he's training and what, Mm -hmm. you know, so, so we're getting indications, you know, clearly, you know, we know what the problem areas are, uh, on the climb, you know, obviously the free blast and, you know, the enduro corner and the clear, definitely the boulder problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a bunch of other sections and he, he starts to work the route. He starts to kind of systematically tick off the sections he knows that he's comfortable with and like the monster off with. Like there are all these pitches that are notorious among professional climbers, Mm -hmm. you know, professional climbers going to free climb, meaning climbing without using points of aid, but still using a rope. But, you know, there are sections on that route that are notoriously difficult. But the boulder problem has a 10-foot section that's incredibly difficult. It's a very intricate sequence. You've got your right hand on a crimp, left hand on a side pull, and then you put your right foot onto this dimple thing. Right hand goes up to a small down-pulling crimp, left foot goes into a little dish, and then you drive up off the left foot into the thumb press. That's the worst hold on the entire route. So you get maybe half your thumb on the hold. Then you roll your two fingers over the thumb, switch your feet, left foot stems out to this really bad sloping black foothold. Switch your thumbs. And then reach out left to a big sloping bread loaf type hold that feels kind of grainy. From there, either karate kick or double dino to an edge on the opposite wall. In some ways, it makes more sense to do the big two-handed jump because you're jumping to a good edge, so there's actually something to catch. But the idea of jumping without a rope seems completely outrageous. If you miss it, that's that. The way that you took something that would be very difficult for the average person to understand and translated it in a way that was not only understandable, but made it like more compelling. Like, oh my God, here he is. He's on that that one point that is going to be, this is the defining moment, you know? Like you did a great job of, of creating like a tense narrative around those moments. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What is it that, I'm sorry, go no, ahead. No, I, some of the, there were some really valuable lessons learned with Meru. Mm-hmm. Um, which made gave us more confidence in decisions we made about how to do that. Yeah. Um, where you could walk, you could see a lot of details. You didn't need to know what they were called. You didn't need. It was all about his own experience of that challenge. And there, you know, vivid things like the thumbs. Like you know, no one will ever forget those thumbs. Uh-huh. What exactly it's called? Is it called a pinch or whatever? Yeah, the, <laughs> it doesn't really the matter. Thumb move on the it's the part. thumb yeah, move, yeah, yeah. yeah. right? Um, or pitches. Like maybe there was a lot of information that was okay if it was not included. Uh-huh. You know, when uh, he finally, when it's the moment and he's beginning. Um, that was in the wake of another attempt where he decides it's not the right day and you guys make adjustments and how you're going to document this because there's some sense that that it's your your process was a little bit too i don't know invasive or in his face or something like that and you have the cameras that are then like in the valley with these huge long lenses but you were still i mean you seem to 
have plenty of documentation. Like you were on the wall and you had the drones and all that kind of stuff, right? Like how, what were the adjustments that you made so that you could still make sure that you were getting the most riveting version of this without being overly interfering? Well, the main adjustment was that a rule that always existed was like really enforced about Alex could only see you if you were filming him on and off mm-hmm. the mountain, right? So it, mostly it was about off the mountain. Yeah. Like that we had 15 people in the valley, but he didn't know that. Um, he didn't know that there were three rented houses in Foresta. You know, he just didn't know the uh-huh. details of what was going on. And in order to minimize the the pressure, you know, that all he knew was that, you know, Jimmy or and Claire Popkin are sit, hanging out in his van, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, and trusting us that if the time came, we would be in place. Um, but in terms, of, I think that there's kind of a almost a, a misperception of what it was like on the wall. Like when you ask about the guidelines, like the main guideline also was that these are elite pro climbers. Right. You know, Jimmy yeah. and the team. They're the number like, one criteria. Yeah. I mean, they're elite pro climbers. So that dangling 20,000 feet to 2,000 feet in the air is normal. Right. And they're comfortable there. So it's not really a question if they would ever drop something or let a rope swing. Like their main job is to make sure that never happens. And I think that Alex trusted, you know, really trusted the people around him. Uh Um, So that, you know, they are dangling next to him and, you know, the the mountain is is undulated. So you can be quite close without him seeing you, but he still needs to know that you're there because no surprise is like, that's Mm -hmm. the worst thing for him Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he can hear you. But, um, you know, there are adjustments like the boulder problem, remote cameras, where is a decision that everyone came to together because his issue was not about dying. It was about having a friend of his watch him die. Yeah. Which in itself is remarkable, right? Yeah. This guy thinking about someone else's emotional experience of his own death. Uh-huh. The guy who really had a, always a very hard time thinking about what anyone else felt. Um, but also very undramatic about it. Like, he's like, <laughs> well, you know, like, yeah, I'm not going to die. Yeah, he's so mad. He's like, so mad. He's like, it's great. well, yeah, I of course I don't want to die. But like, you know, dying while my friend's watching me, well, you know, yeah, that would be kind of a bummer. You yeah. know, like, he's so low key about it. No, it, and it, it comes with, the territory when you spend a lot of time in that space, you know, and, and he, he, he says it all the time. He's like, you know, free soloing gives me perspective because when I'm standing in the airport line and there's a guy in front of me just having a a, like Mm -hmm. shit fit, like he can, you know, he's like, well, at least you're not going to die. you know, Right. (laughs) And he can kind of keep it. Um, yeah, I feel like with Alex, the uh, you know the line of questioning is always like you know what's your relationship with fear and death and all of these things, and people have a hard time wrapping their heads around it. And I, I kind of look at him as somebody who has perhaps one of the healthiest relationships um, with death because he's so close to it all the time that it allows his life to present itself in technicolor. Right. Like he's able to be um, incredibly present and like grateful for the moment that he's in because he's so closely connected to this thing that's going to happen to all of us. But which we all dismiss or try to pretend, you know, isn't going to happen. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right about that. And that that comes back to the, the idea of his, you know, intention in living, intentional living. Mm-hmm. I mean, he is acutely, you know, aware of of his time, and and that even for us being around him for this long has 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 like rubbed off, you know, has affected us. I think you know, in what way? Just he he walks the walk, you know. I mean, he he holds himself to a very high standard, and. And then you see him, you know, whether it's executing on his climbing or if it's carrying a dirty old, you know, half liter Nalgene, not Nalgene bottle, but like Gatorade Gatorade bottle bottle that he's had for six months. So nasty. And, you know, he's put protein drinks in it every day for six Uh months and carries it around internationally 
the same old yeah Gatorade because bottle. yeah you know, want it, it's a perfectly good bottle and it still mm-hmm. doesn't leak and it still does its job i mean the pants he's wearing on the climb he's you know by the time he climbs you you look at the bottom of his they're pants, afraid at the they're bottom, afraid yeah. at the bottom uh those pair that pair of pants he did like a legendary climb like years before one of the great alpine climbs of all time where he did the entire fitz traverse in patagonia but anyways that's another story but it was a tremendously difficult climb and he shredded his pants on it and then we saw him in new york and we were like what are those pants you're wearing and he's going on his book tour and he's like, oh, these are the same pants I wore on my Fitz Traverse. <laughs> and I'm going on a date uh-huh. in them tonight. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. but to the point being like, you know, he's very conscious of not being wasteful. Yeah. And y- y- you can't be around that all the time without starting to see, you know, your own actions uh-huh. over the course of the day. Well, that know, red like, t-shirt is he's in like, in like every photo he's wearing the same red t-shirt. Well, there's, the, there's a logic behind that too. And I get that beyond not being wasteful. He also, he always wants to minimize variables. So he wants to wear the exact same clothing on the actual climb that he has trained in. That's why in the morning he gets up and he already has his muesli breakfast built. And at the exact same time, he, he for the month leading up to it, he was getting up at four in the morning so that he would be regular mm-hmm. at five, go to the bathroom, mm-hmm. because he knew that he would start up the wall at five and he didn't want to make it feel early. And he wanted to have gone to the bathroom and he wanted to have had his breakfast. And so he, so that when the day came, he could just go on autopilot and mm-hmm. everything would be right. the same. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned the book tour. So Alex is on this book tour, speaking tour, and as was you, you talked about this at the premiere when you were on stage. <laughs> like he, he was like on, on Tinder or whatever and trying to get a date like in every city. Totally, he actually did set up dates <laughs> in every city. It was. Amazing. I almost wanted to raise my hand and say like please read me what your, tw- what your Tinder profile said. Like, I would love to see like how he <laughs> characterized it, himself it was on a that, dating um, site. You know, it's that fancy site, like Thoraya. It's not no, Thoraya, no, no, no. Raya. 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 I don't Raya. even know what that is. So it, yeah. it mines your Instagram feed mm. and your Pandora, like, preferences. So it was basically heavy metal photos of Alex shirtless, mm. like, in spectacular places. Oh, my God. Um and it was hilarious. I mean, just, I would always be like, what do you tell these women that you do for a living? Uh-huh. Do you tell them that you live in a van? Like, <laughs> I mean, it w- and it was amazing because we we're like, uh-huh. oh, great. We have, like, documentaries are never funny enough. Like, it's always my dream to, like, make a very funny uh-huh. documentary. And I was like, great, we've got a funny documentary, which will help because the stakes are terrifying on this film. And it'll be a way to give people a release. And then Sonny arrived. Yeah. So she moved into the van with us. We were there first. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> so, um, but... She is just a very special person. Yeah. And um, it, it, was, it was a real turning point for the film. Yeah, um, and, and one of the things that you said that, that evening at the premiere was um, how important it was to you and to the movie to get that part of the story right. So what is it that you really wanted to make sure that got properly conveyed by virtue of that relationship? Well, I think in all of our films um, together... Um, being very mindful and thoughtful about how everyone is represented is really important. And, but especially, you know, the women in the film, I mean, the men too, but, um, it just seemed that there are always women in these particular types of stories have always, have oftentimes been portrayed a certain way. It was like, Mm -hmm. what was me? I'm staying at home. And these women are not like that. And Sonny is a very good example of someone who is emotionally articulate and self-confident enough to push back on Alex, but also find this place where she can love him for who he is, which was like a revelation for Alex. Like, he, I don't think he's ever had that experience. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I don't think his parents looked at him that way. Right. Like, um, but so just giving her the space and allowing the discomfort of what it felt like when she pushed back on Alex right before the climb, like, because it's an incredibly uncomfortable moment in the film. 
um, it makes you feel conflicted about her, conflicted about him, but just allowing those moments to live because that was the right thing to, like, it was the right representation is honest. Yeah, it's so um, human. It's so, is she, it's sort of a passive aggressive comment that she 100%. makes where it's like, you know, it's okay if you don't do this, you know, and you're like, what's behind that? Mm-hmm. Or um, yeah. the dream. I dreamt that you fell in the same place the day, and we know that he's climbing. He's going to go free solo in two days. Mm-hmm. She doesn't know. Like those are really difficult things to include and to witness. But it just seemed really important for her character and for his character. Um, and do you feel like Alex compartmentalizes all of that, or is he really? Does that play on his? I mean, he's very clear. Like this isn't going to influence my decision. But I, w- on a human level, it's hard to imagine that it doesn't impact how he thinks about what he does. I think if you were to answer the question now, it would clearly impact what he does. Like they were six this months new. into yeah. a relationship. He was nine years into a dream, and that. I think he. I think he's being very candid when he says that. You yeah. know, that's understandable. This was a dream he had, and then he met someone. Uh-huh. And where is that going to go? They don't know. Um, but I think that if like they're still together, it's been three years, and that's a different type of conversation now, mm-hmm. which is interesting. And you know, I'm very happy for Alex. Right. So, what does it look like now then? So, it, do you, it, you think it will have a, a, some level of impact on what he chooses to do next? Yeah, at this point, yeah. I think so. Mm-hmm. And and I mean, he's already, you know, admittedly changed in in ways. Uh, particularly, he said, you know, when I watch the film, I, I see these things that I say to her, and I think, wow, that's I need to work on that. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, he uh, has a really a, a deep sense of self awareness around these things. I think. He does and he doesn't, uh-huh. you know, it's like he doesn't sometimes in the moment, but then on reflection, he is all about self-betterment, you know, all the time. So it was, whether it was the ve- eating vegetables or not knowing how to hug and learning how to hug uh-huh. and uh, he's constantly looking for best practices, but they, they often feel very unemotional and like yeah. robotic, yeah. which kind of throws people and his friends, sometimes. but that makes it comedic too. Yeah. I mean, he's unapologetically he's honest. Yeah, yeah he's but trying then he to be. Tries. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, he's trying. Uh-huh. I should be more emotional. Like, uh-huh. oh no, on the, at the you know, there's that point in the film where he's like, "I'm feeling quite emotional." <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and that that is like him being emotional. Him being like, uh-huh. that's why. I, and then I you joke saying the like, film, "I'm glad." Yeah, Spock is Spock human. Is, yeah, Spock has nerves. Right. Because sometimes we're like. Is, hello. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, the most uncomfortable he looks in the entire movie is when he's standing in that house in Vegas or when they're like shopping and you're like, I'm almost like uncomfortable watching him yeah. doing, doing that. It's like, it's so out of place. Yeah. You know, and he's trying. He's like, I want to do this. And he's, you can, you know, he's, uh, I don't know. It just, it, it was fascinating to watch that without him saying anything. I think he's trying really hard. And I think I don't think Alex is ever going to change. Like, his, he feels this range of emotions, whereas most people feel maybe that range of emotions. Mm-hmm. I don't think that will change for him. Yeah. But I do, what I think is, like, I've been th- we've been thinking a lot, as we're talking about this with other people and being asked these questions, I've been thinking a lot about the motiv- his motivations or the why in his idea of self-betterment. Because I, I don't think it's necessarily about self-betterment. The more I think about it, I think... You know, like what he says, other people seem to enjoy hugging. I might as well try that. I think it's about communicating. You know, it's about him trying to understand more about what other people, human like having beings. something more in common with people. <laughs> like, this, what would a normal human being do in <laughs> yeah. this situation? No, no, yeah. and, try, and trying to understand that experience. Yeah. Like, m- normal people should have a house. Like, you yeah. know, should have a house. Like, he is an alien that yeah. came to planet Earth <laughs> yes. and studying what <laughs> yeah. it means to be human. And he yeah. wants to communicate. That. He wants uh-huh. to touch yeah. people. And that's really interesting to me. Um <laughs> Right. What yeah, uh? Really funny. What didn't make it into the final edit that like was difficult for you to cut out? Like some other aspects of the story. You know, we had the real privilege of having time when we made this film, so we worked like we tried everything. Right? Uh-huh. There's no um, idea that wasn't tried and. The question is, did we go back again to try it? Like, that's kind of the level mm-hmm. of how much playing we were doing. 
um, like once we got the film to a certain place, did we have the, did we actually go back to that original idea and see if we could make it work? Um, and I guess there's there's nothing I regret um, that we regret. Yeah. There's one thing that popped up the other day that I kind of began to regret, which was the rock. There was a rock that fell in Morocco. Yeah. Um, while they were climbing, it was it was a freak normal like a, it's something that happens on climbs, but it was pretty dramatic. But we didn't get it on camera, uh-huh. and everyone was very shook, like shaken up, and it didn't fit. Like we tried everything, and people were too animated, so it didn't feel serious. And but it would have been wonderful. Like it mm-hmm. would have been very meaningful if we could have made that work. But mm-hmm. there are no regrets with this film. Like I, yeah, I'm, I yeah. think that we really tried everything we could, and that feels good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've been traveling around, screening the movie all over the place. It's getting you know this incredible response right now from all different kinds of people. I mean, you guys must just be elated and delighted. Super exciting. I mean, I would imagine you're going to get Oscar shortlisted. You know, you guys are on an incredible trajectory. What has the experience been for you guys sharing the movie and watching, gauging like audience reactions to it? It's been humbling, um, and we were so immune to this. One, we were just so relieved that Alex is fine. Like, the uh-huh. best day of this production was right. the day he, you know, free sold El Cap, and we knew we were okay. I can't you know? imagine the yeah. cathartic release. It was it was such a profound release and relief. It was a big yeah. relief. And, and the thing is, is I, I kind of had made a deal with myself or with the universe or at some point probably the month or the week leading up to when he finally did it, which was that, you know, in those moments when you're like, the idea of him pulling it off, us filming it successfully, everybody being okay, the crew being safe, it seems so out of reach. And yeah. I remember thinking, if if we ever pull this off, if he ever pulls this off, like, everything else will be gravy. Like the film, Mm -hmm. whatever happens with the film, it's all going to be gravy. And, uh, and I, you know, I kind of go back to that through this experience, um, where I'm like, you know what, we're so fortunate to have been able to have this experience. I mean, the process of the production was really intense, but it was like an expedition where it's difficult. <laughs> the, what the four hundred and fifty day expedition? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, it's that long. Oh yeah, but you wow. know when, when you suffer through this thing, uh-huh. but you achieve you know what seemed like an impossible goal, yeah. and there's you know a deep satisfaction with that, and so you know there's there's you, you we try to enjoy, we're trying to enjoy the moment. Uh, we're trying not to put too much into it. I mean, we we're putting everything into it, but I just mean like attachment to. Yeah, what I'm comes trying to stay it, centered right? about it. Like we pr- appreciate looking across an ocean of heads that are like in a theater, mm-hmm. gripped, watching your movie. I mean, that feels great, you know. Um, but yes, we're we're just we're very happy and grateful. So we were relieved when he did it, and then like the on like the onset of like. Oh no, we have to bring it now. Like you know, we we have got to make the you he did owe this ex- it to him. We owe it yeah, to him right. too, and he's <laughs> shown up in these intimate moments. Like we have to make the most of it. So then having Our crew is I mean, everyone good. was so committed, and so mm-hmm. then having that time to really experiment and explore and push was great. But it, we became immune, right? Like it's not, it's just a shot now. Mm-hmm. When it, like in the edit room, I was like, oh, that's a nice shot of the mountain, and. When we went to Telluride and watched it with an audience, and it was 10 o'clock at night, it was the world premiere, it was a huge auditorium, and just looking at everyone from Tommy Caldwell, his wife, Sonny, all our cinematographers, the producers sitting there in one row, sobbing and experiencing <laughs> probably like a profound P- PTSD on some level. Yeah, right. Because we had this exercise for, three, for two years of like, mm. don't feel anything in front of Alex. So no one, like you put it away mm-hmm. and suddenly you can let it out. Yeah. Um, and that audience too. Yeah, no, and the audience and we were like, like triggering wow, it I and forgot. like being part of this. Um, so it's just been, it's been a real privilege and like a great, like I, I think we keep on saying to each other and I keep on saying to Jimmy and Alex a lot, like this doesn't happen. Yeah. Like this is a moment and it's really special. And I wonder what it is about the film in this moment. And that's kind of an interesting question. Yeah. But um just let's just enjoy it 
you know. It's so cool. I mean, it was screening at the Cinerama Dome in Hollywood. Like, when was the last time a documentary period was on the screen at that theater? But you it's, know, it's insane. It's an interesting story because we were so, it's all about where you open in L.A., right? Uh-huh. What theater will take this movie? And we couldn't book it. We couldn't book it. We couldn't book it. And like three weeks before Arclight came in. And that was great. We're like, mm-hmm. it's amazing. We got one of their screens at the Arclight. And it was the Wednesday before, because everything got sold out so fast, that there was a sense on our side, like, we need more screens, we need more screens, and like no one wanted to give us more screens. Um, and on the Wednesday before, um, one person from our team was checking the ticket sales and, you know, like, um, tapped on the Arclight link and saw that they had added, it was like 14 more screenings on Thursday and Friday, uh-huh. including the Cinerama Dome. They gave yeah, us three yeah. screens. Like, the whole, like, it just overnight happened. And that was almost, that was amazing. Like, we and didn't we even know. Right. Like, we just didn't know. Yeah. And then and, it happened. And it ended up, it's the highest per screen yeah. average of, like, any documentary or yeah. something like opening that. Like, weekend. Yeah, opening weekend. weekend. Yeah. Right. That is crazy. Ever. <laughs> it was thanks to Arclight. They gave it, I mean, they gave it, they believed yeah. in it and um, gave us those screens. Because uh-huh. otherwise, you just can't throw a number like that. Yeah. Yeah. The wild thing was, as I'm watching it, you get lost in the narrative and, and, and you're just like, oh, my God, is it, you know, what, is he going to fall? Is he going to fall? And I'm like... Well, he's sitting right there. Like, you know, I know that he's fine. He gave me a hug. He's been practicing his hug. So I was like, it's all good. Yeah. And yet you still couldn't help but, like, become incredibly tense and anxious. Yeah. You know, even when you know what's going to happen. Yeah. 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 No, it's it's funny. I mean, the number of people who come out of the theater that are shell-shocked and just look at you and say, Uh uh-huh. I mean, the number of times I've heard, my hands are still sweating, you know? Um, It's just, I I never anticipated that much of a reaction. And so I, I, you know, on on this tour, it's it's fun. I love going for the last 15 minutes. And, you know, I don't watch the movie. I watch people. Mm -hmm. And I, I love watching that, you know, when people have their hands over their eyes or they're gripping their partner next to them. I mean, I think it's a great date movie. Yeah. You know, people yeah, are always yeah, yeah, like yeah. grabbing each other, holding <laughs> each other, you know. It's a horror theater. movie. It's a comedy. <laughs> it's just, it's that has been uh, something I didn't expect and uh-huh. I really enjoy. Yeah. From a technical perspective, I thought it was really interesting trying to deconstruct how you actually did this. I mean, there is a mix of special effects that are layered in, and I couldn't really tell where that began and end. Like, mm-hmm. I knew you used Google Earth, and yeah. you have these amazing shots where you're pushing in on the wall. Yeah. Um, and it gave you, like, because you see the wall, and you're like, yeah, it's a big wall. But it's only when you kind of zeroed in on them, and then you would see just how tiny, you know, the bodies yeah. were against it, that mm-hmm. you really got a sense of just how the largesse of, of the affair yeah, that was definitely one of the challenges because we've all been there, you know, China and the whole uh-huh. team have stood under El Cap and I've climbed El Cap a lot of times. I mean, it's the scale. I mean, it is so big and it's really, really hard to translate that. On yeah, screen. it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't get conveyed. No. So right? we worked very hard. We spent a lot of time. But it was it's a good example that. of our partnership for Jimmy would come in and watch these cuts and be like, El Cap doesn't look big enough. And I'd be like. You didn't give me a shot that makes yeah. it look big enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be like, well, what's up with these guys? They've had it for two months. They still can't make it look big enough? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it just kept, it was the, the push of it. Like, but we it could, doesn't know. We just didn't have enough information. Right. Um, and yeah. so finally, it was, it was funny. It was like, we, our process, I think it's, it's fair to say that we keep on tweaking to the bitter end. You know, like, I don't know until you're right if mm-hmm. it was even the final version of the movie. You know, like, keep on tweaking. And right before we were locking, it was just, I was walking along the street and I was like, wait. Wait, Google probably has better images. I wonder if they'd give them to us. Mm. And then they did. And so, wow, we were, so that was very late. It was very late. Very and late. It, then it took, you know, weeks to negotiate them to give us the information. Uh-huh. And then the files arrived and they were too big. Like it was they just this huge. It was so a whole just thing. Ingesting it into the uh-huh. you know, it took weeks. The and then um, but then they were able to create this three dimensional mountain that worked. Because that was the whole thing. They, they would only be able to get it in a certain in a certain tightness, and that would just kind of defeat the purpose, yeah. right? You have to go all the way, or it's like, what's the point? Right. Well, that, I mean, that was brilliant because that really did make a huge difference mm. in, in helping you to understand the the gravity of the whole thing. Mm. What was uh, what was like the other than 
the simple fact that you have a dear friend who could possibly die, like what is what was the hardest part of this whole process? I think there's two, you know, I think that we both each kind of focused on tackling our respective, you know, spots. I mean, I think for there's the, the Verite filming and just getting, mm-hmm. putting in that time and getting Alex and Sonny to just co- totally commit and give in and submit to the camera and... <laughs> Submit. Yes. Just, just not submit. No, it is. Um, well, you just have to leave it rolling yeah, long enough yeah. until yeah. they're not aware they're that it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. Yes. The, the 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 work itself. But I do you think it was it was the it was the pressure. It was oh, yeah. it was this it was no, the, I guess the idea that he could die, um, that never went away, um, and that yeah, you woke up with every day. And also Even like, when we are in on location. And also, like, of our there. crew itself, because normally these types of high-angle shoots don't last for as long as ours did and don't have that many people. So our exposure was significant. Yeah. So the day wasn't over until they were all on the ground. And that was a thing. Like, you know, you kind of... You'd hopefully not eat before them. And, but like, it wasn't... That wasn't the point. The point was, like, just make sure they're back and okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, we pulled um, on dinner. Like, Morocco... Is Mikey down yet? Yeah, Are they right. down yet? Yeah. You know, I mean. And Morocco was pretty extreme as an experience. Like, it's seven minutes in the movie. It was three weeks of shooting in, like, pretty intense, situ- um, envi- in pretty intense climbing environment. So I think, but it was always just the idea that Alex could die and did we make the right decision as much as we believed we did. Um, and please let us have made the right decision and Alex make good decisions. Yeah. And- and there was the possibility, of course, that he could have decided to not do it at all, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that would have been fine. <laughs> yeah, but uh, as Alex says, but the movie would have sucked. <laughs> it would have been a harder yeah, movie to make. Like, it would have been harder. <laughs> but it wasn't going to be like he decided not to do it. It would be a question of when. Uh-huh. I'm not doing it this year. Okay, we'll yeah. see you next year. Like waiting around for six years, but you're getting kind of old, Alex. That's okay. Like uh-huh. you know. Um, he was so obsessed with it that um, he, was he just felt like it. he it was, was going happen. to yeah. do it. And when he achieves it and he you know, gets to the top and he's like, I'm so delighted. You know, it's so, <laughs> there's something really childlike and, and innocent mm-hmm. and, and pure you know, and beautiful about, because it's so honest to him, mm-hmm. you know. It goes, but like funny too, like what a weird thing totally, to say, you know. It's totally, <laughs> I mean, every screening. Yeah. You know, people laugh at that uh-huh. moment because he, he he's accomplished this like insane goal, and and he looks up and he's like, "I'm so delighted." And, yeah, you know he his he has this kind of way of thinking about it too, which is very smart. I mean, he's very smart, and he he's like, you know, I can't build it up into something bigger than it is, which would be hard anyways. But his whole idea is that, you know. This isn't a stunt. Like he knows he's put the time in. He knew he was ready, and he, he wouldn't do it until he was a hundred percent. You know, like he wasn't going to go for it fully if he he didn't feel comfortable walking up mm-hmm. to it and going up it. But his point, because people have asked him about it, and you know, his response is like, "Yeah, I'm not like jumping up and down for joy because I." you know, robbed the bank and got away with it. He's like, I, I knew I had it, yeah. you know? And he always also describes, you know, if you're in a, if, you know, the emotional spectrum is one to 10, he lives between 4.6 and 5.2. Uh huh. And if he's super riled up, he gets to like 5.6, yeah. you know? And so he, he just, <laughs> Uh, that that's his natural response, yeah. you know. But and that it, smile, his smile is. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a million dollar smile. Yeah. Um, but it's really just uh, the accomplishment is just uh, an external manifestation of, of who he is and what was within him the whole time. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't a. It's not a destination oriented thing. Like no. okay, I did this. Like now I'm done. 
And, you know, he goes back to the van and he's like doing pull-ups like the same day, like, (laughs) you know, it's just, this is, uh, this is who this guy is like through, through and through and through. Um, one question I have for you guys, uh, is, and I'm interested if you answer this different, um, what, what do you think makes a great documentary? Like what are the elements that differentiate like a good documentary for from one that like really sings for me it always is about the story and then probably the character i know we make these visually you know we have very high expectations for ourselves visually Mm -hmm. but you know it was funny i was just going with our editor through like my earlier films and went back, he went back to watch my first film, um, you know, and that was shot on a, you know, a tiny mini DV camera, um, by me <laughs> and, you know, and the characters in that film are just remarkable, you know? And so, and their story was amazing. So I don't, you know, I think of things like street fight, you know, um, Marshall Curry's film that he shot on another mini DV camera uh-huh. about, um, Cory Booker, you know, first, um, race. And, you know, I, I think you just have to have that story and that character and you can make a wonderful film. And then the other part of that is clearly the gaze, like the G-A-Z-E of it, like that, that your own intention as a filmmaker is, it will very much define that, Uh you know? And do you think those principles apply, whether it's narrative or documentary? I mean, you, you've done a lot in, in documentary filmmaking, you've worked with all kinds of interesting people and made many other films, but you also work with Mike Nichols on Closer, right? Like, what do you learn from, I mean, a master storyteller that informs the films that you make now? I mean, it's story. I mean, it was yeah. always story for Mike and character. <laughs> yeah. Those are his two things. I think his process was really interesting. Like, he still rehearsed. He would work with the writer in rehearsal with the real actors, mm. saying their lines and, like, breaking it apart. And how he really focused on those performances. And, he, I mean, Mike is a, was a genius. Like, the amount of things. Mm. Like, he was the type of guy that in the room he would notice what the person in the corner was saying. And if it was something of, you know, of worth, he would, no matter who you are, he would engage. Because he would remember that that person had said it. Um and yeah, for him it was always story and character. So yeah. it's the same thing. Yeah, Jimmy. Yeah, I mean, I, how can I argue with that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, but I. But you come I, to I it draw, from a, from a more of a DP perspective. Sure. Yeah. I mean, visually, of course. I mean, I love you know creating the visuals. Yeah. That's part of what I do and who I am. Uh, But I always kind of go back to what I personally love about films. And, you know, for films that really moved me um, emotionally, that made me feel something. Who are your guys? Like, who are the... I mean, like, the most recent example, I don't know. I mean, there's... I guess this is more narrative, but, you know, I grew up... (laughs) Well... I, I'm just trying to think of something most recent. Like I, I loved uh, Hurt Locker. I loved Damien Chazelle's um, Whiplash mm-hmm. too. I mean, the Have you seen First Man yet? And we saw First mm-hmm. Man. Um, I loved Senna too. So the, there's oh, I two that things movie. that I I, yeah. I I love is when you're really moved emotionally. I remember watching The Power of One back. You know, there were some films that like yeah. that's the, made me feel something deeply, uh-huh. and like, and I love that experience because you're being transported somewhere, and you feel something. And I always want to make films where people feel something. You know, where they're like moved emotionally. And I also love um, being transported in a world. And I think Senna did this for me, where you're like, mm, yeah, race car driving. I know it's kind of dangerous, and like. I'm not that interested in race car driving. Uh And I came out of that movie being like, whoa. You know, I was like, Formula One is so gnarly. It was so pushing the edge. It's like, I get what they're pushing for and I understand the ambition and like what it means. So those kind of things, I I have, you know, 
Vermeru, the previous film, like those, you know, I remember Hurt Locker and Senna informed some of my mm-hmm. thinking around mm-hmm. it. Um, yeah, but I it, love the emotional. Yeah. What's interesting about what you do, though, is that for most documentary filmmakers that are sort of on the periphery, and I, I suppose for this movie, you had to be more on the periphery than you usually are, but mm-hmm. but generally, it's an immersive process for you where you are participant and observer at the same time, mm-hmm. which is unique, which is unique. Like you're, you're telling the story and you're part of the story as well. Yeah. And I, I feel like it's always, cause I'm feeling deeply on these productions. You know, I feel something very deeply when I'm in it just cause you are in it. And it's, I don't think it's necessarily special, but the, you know, it's important for me, you know, to bring that feeling and hopefully share it, right. you know, bring it through the screen and give it to to the people watching it. And that's, thankfully, I have a child to help me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would think, that. like, Jimmy is like a literal translation of that, where I think that most, like, all filmmakers or all authors, like, yeah. you are an active yeah, participant in what you're doing. Um and that that's like a responsibility, um, yeah. but at least with, like with Jimmy, like it has to be a palpable. It's like a palpable thing. Like you're you're watching it, mm-hmm. and he as he's doing it. What it, what do you want audiences to take away from this movie, or do you want to just allow them to have their own experience? But like, what is your do you have an intention behind that? No, my, it's kind of what I took away from Alex's story, which is here is this incredibly scared kid who's a loner who began climbing without a rope because it was scarier to talk to somebody to be his, ask them to be his partner. And who, you know, was intimidated by vegetables, scared of hugs, scared of intimacy, any intimacy, and methodically taught himself, you know, to work through his own fears. And that is very, very moving to me Mm -hmm. because I feel like everyone has a fear like that. We're not that extreme maybe, but there are lots of things that scare us. Um, And the process of him working his way through his fears is what? Like he places himself in the most fear-inducing scenarios a human being could imagine. Well, I think it's little by little, right? Like he practiced hugging and that's yeah. how he introduced one vegetable a month. Right. Um, and yes, and then he decided that he wanted to climb this uh-huh. mountain. So he began, he spent, you know, 15 years of his career preparing for doing something bigger and badder. Um but I think he also has this courage that I hope people take away from the film. Like, it's very inspiring what, what he's done and how he looks at it and how he... And also this communal experience that happens. Like, it's about communicating yeah. and courage and doing something. So, you know. And, know. and what is it that you think makes him unique? Like, if you had to define what makes him special and distinct from his peers within that community and even in general... I think that his absolute like adherence to a life of intention makes him incredibly unique. Yeah. Um, like that is real and it, and it's, and it's inspiring. It's uncompromising yeah. and yeah. it's yeah. inspiring. And then you add to that, that he's clearly a genius. Like he's an absolute genius, but he's also has this discipline that is unheard of. Like it is, ap- it's discipline. That mm-hmm. make, that's what makes him great. Um, Cause I'm sure Tommy could be a better climber than he is. Like, but Alex's like discipline just helps him move through all these challenges. Right. Like his talent is on par with his peers, but his talent isn't the dis- the deciding factor. It's not like he's more talented than anyone else. It's something else. Not not necessarily physically. Right. That's what I meant, physical but, talent. I mean, he's unmatched, like, on his mental capacity mm-hmm. to... I mean, we always kind of say that it's his his one superpower. Yeah. He has a superpower. That he can but it's, his, it. it's it's like he's able to take his emotional, mental, physical, spiritual selves and distill. condense them, distill them down into yeah. one thing that's working in perfect unison. I, I think you're very. That's very good observation because if if you look at soloing, it is it is like the purest form of climbing, right? I mean, you are stripped to even not having a harness and ropes. It is the purest expression. Of, I mean, 
maybe he could do it naked, but otherwise, yeah. like, it is, like, the purest expression of climbing. I don't think we'd want to see but, him do it naked. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's uh-huh. like, it's a, and, and he's like that. <laughs> he's like that, though. It should be pretty fun. It made me think of the who, the guy in the bunny suit on the wall. or yeah. the, the Unicorn. Yeah. The uh, unicorn, unicorn right, yeah. No, but like you said, he, he distills, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's all about uh, efficiency distilling down to the, these very you know, everything to its finest form, essentially. And that is is a constant engine running in his head yeah. for everything. What do you think he's going to do next? I think he's, you know, we've had a, a few conversations about it as this thing starting to blow up, yeah. you know, um, and get bigger and bigger, uh, talking about, you know, how you manage it and what, you know, and we talked a lot about, taking taking his time you know there's no rush to be inspired again but and there's no need to force anything unless he's inspired by it and so i think he's kind of biding his time i think he's going to pivot a lot of his attention towards his foundation which he really believes in uh you know his belief is like there's no use in being famous if it's not being used for good and so he has like a good pivot point for it and you know Climbing has a lot of different expressions. Uh, speed climbing. Like he finished this climb, went to Alaska, did a big alpine climb, went to Antarctica. Mm-hmm. We went to Antarctica together. He went to broke the speed record on the nose. I mean, he's actively training and climbing because he has other climbing goals. Um, but does he need to do another bigger solo? I mean, Probably not. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, if he's inspired. Well, he's definitely played his man card. I mean, <laughs> yeah. he doesn't have anything to prove to anybody <laughs> no. or himself, really. It's no. just his internal, you know, drive to express himself. Yeah. And that, yeah. The, the, the funny thing is, is like, he, he, he did it for himself. You know, yeah. he wasn't even trying to play the man card. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 the beautiful, he has that beautiful line in the movie where he's like, look, it's more important to me to do this. What's important is that I do this and do it the way that I want to do it, not that it be documented. I'm mean, yeah. paraphrasing. I don't remember the yeah. exact line. Like, but I don't care if it's filmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. What about you guys? What are you going to do next? It's a good question. You set the bar pretty high. <laughs> That's, I mean, I have to say. <laughs> do you like, feel that pressure? Um, like, after Meru, yeah. we felt that pressure uh-huh. profoundly because it's like it doesn't get much. You know, we fell in love while making mm-hmm. Meru. We had a child. We... Um, Meru was made for nothing, and then it, w- it made all this money. Like, there was this, like, thing that we could we ever... Meru was Shakespearean <laughs> as a film. Um, so I'm just excited to do something a little different. Like, we, we began working on a film concurrently um, about Christine Tompkins and Tompkins Conservation, mm-hmm. and Christine Tompkins and the late D- Doug Tompkins, and it's kind of like an out of Africa for our generation. It's oh, like wow. it's building on this idea of intention, a life of intention. It's a little more radical even than free soloing. Yeah, yeah. um, there is a mountain, but not a main mountain. Uh-huh. Um, this is like a whole new thing for Jimmy. And, but these yeah. are his best friends. <laughs> so these are my... Uh-huh. So, and it's just, I'm excited to, I've never made, we've never made a film about someone who's passed already. And so Doug Tompkins had died several years ago, tragically. And like, yeah. that's kind of an interesting challenge. And the characters are so rich on this film More and there's archival. a lot of archival. Uh-huh. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm excited to kind of tackle with something else while we are exploring what else is in our future but, yeah but it's deeply meaningful it's, it's important to me and to try and we've you know yvonne chenard and that and doug and and chris and rick ridgeway that circle of friends have been well clearly an influence on a lot of people but you know have been very dear kind of mentors and friends that i've looked up to for a very long time and uh-huh. i've gotten to know for over the last 15, 20 years. And our kids get to go to Patagonia. It's going right. to be great. And we have, we have yeah, we love them, you yeah. know, uh-huh. deeply. Family and traveling. so there feels like a lot of, yeah, inspiration and That's meaning cool. behind it. You know, yeah. I, I don't want, I only want to, well, as you can imagine, you, 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 throw down a lot for documentaries yeah and you're, you're basically making a decision for the next few years, however many life. years. Yeah. yeah. We get faster though. Uh, I yeah. found, like, I've, this is my sixth film now. This will be my seventh. I feel like uh, every film I've basically cut the ratio in half. But isn't this, doesn't the story dictate that? Sure. Yeah. But you also get better. Yeah. It's clear. Well, you have, I mean, there's 
something magical in the alchemy between the two of you. You know, Manhattan, born and bred, Minnesota, yeah. Wyoming, climber. Like it's a, you know, it's an unlikely pairing, yeah. but there's something really cool in how you complement each other. Well, with we this. both come from Chinese yeah. tiger moms. Like, I mean, okay, like <laughs> yeah. our moms probably had a lot in common. Uh-huh. And it's was it full on tiger general. mom? Oh, yeah. oh I'm half. Yeah. Like I'm half Chinese, so yeah. I had like this whole nice Hungarian Brazilian like professorial dad right. who like very much wants me to do what I believe in, whereas my mom still uh-huh. will be like, it's not too late to go to med school. Yeah. You're so yeah, good yeah, with your hands. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but I think my mom I, is not a tiger mom. Uh, she's not Chinese, but she still asks me if she thinks I'm going to go, I'm 52 years old. I'm going to go to medical school. I mean, like, I, I, when are you going to get a real I, job? Yeah, I get that a lot. But anyway, go ahead. Um, no, no, it's a thing, yeah. but it's definitely this deep, we know where each other comes from when it comes to the really important things. Uh-huh. And that's something that's very safe and warm and special yeah. um, for both of us, I think. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. But you have, you have this Upper East Side, you know, rearing. People say, this like, people say this like it's like a poison. Right. My parents were immigrants. Mm-hmm. Okay, they moved. I was conceived in L.A. Clear the record. Okay. okay, my dad was a professor at Columbia. You know, it's just, it was a good place to raise kids. Yeah. The same way that Jimmy's parents had read that Minnesota was a good place to uh-huh. move to raise children. Right. And so there were librarians at the University of Minnesota, Mankato. So it's like we, ha- it was, um, I think New York City has this like bad rap. Um, where I would more say like it was this opportunity to go to an amazing girl's school, you know, that shaped everything for me, um, and let us eat Chinese food every weekend, uh-huh. you know, like it's like the city with everything. Yeah. Um, but both my parents worked and were also really dedicated to my brother uh-huh. and myself. So it, it, I don't know. And Jimmy, you have academic parents, but tiger mom like how do you get you like we don't have time to explore your whole backstory (laughs) we gotta wrap this up no no both both parents were uh highly attuned to excellence yeah jimmy played till book 15 of suzuki okay like he is like a really Really? accomplished musician i started playing Uh violin when i was three i mean we still have this violin it is Uh amazing like it's this big yeah and I um, played through high school, and then I picked up a guitar. He was swimming. Yeah. He was like all like I mean, but, swim champion in Minnesota. Uh-huh. Um, there was no drive there. And martial arts. I basically mm. competed in. You know, you were a swimmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have meets every yeah. weekend, but they were throwing in martial arts competitions on top of them. Oh wow! And and, and you know, playing the violin. Yeah, and playing you had to do it all. So he was ready for the mean streets of Manhattan. Uh-huh. Yeah. So what do they think of what you're doing now? Well, they both passed. Oh, they have. I'm sorry. To that, that. Yeah, but they, you know, they got to see it. I'm very happy that they got to see, you know, they, once I started publishing and I was in the magazines and stuff like that, you know, uh-huh. my mom had a stack of magazines this big with little markers oh, sticking cool. out of them, you know, in the living room. And I'd be like, mom, that's so embarrassing. Can you put that away? Um, but it's like she, she would just put all of them. So she, she was... Yeah. And your dad was pretty yeah, proud so. of our two kids. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah that, I they, kids. that was also like a big event in everyone's lives. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I got to release you guys um, to your lives. But I thought a good way to kind of close it down would be to maybe impart a little bit of inspiration or wisdom to the aspiring filmmakers out there. I mean, you guys have achieved something extraordinary with the work that you have done and I have no doubt will continue to do uh, for people out there that are interested in either narrative or documentary filmmaking and are struggling to figure out their voice or how to get going. What, what can you say to those people? I think that making films is hard. So if you're going to make a film, it should be about something that is incredibly meaningful to you. You know, and that's 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 why you, mm-hmm. you would use your voice, um, so that that meaning, you know, find that meaning, you know, and it's okay to wait until you find it or like bumble yeah. along the way and find it later. But it just the, the it should be meaningful. Yeah, I, I mean, I would echo that. I mean, it's it's really about finding. It's a bigger question. It's about finding your purpose and finding what gives you meaning and f- finding things that you're inspired and passionate about because 
like Jai said, it, it's very hard to make films, but when you find something that gives you that drive and, and purpose, um, it's a lot. You have to be relentless regardless. You know, yeah. it's a lot easier when you find something that has a lot of meaning right. behind it. Cool. All right, I think that's a good way to end it, you guys. Thanks. Yeah, How do thank you, you so much for thank having you. us here. We're very sincere. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's an extraordinary accomplishment. Um, free Solo, which should have been called Solo, by the way, except for a pesky Star Wars film that happened to come out, right? <laughs> Alex told me like that was the original title. It, it was, was and we tried. We were yeah. like, we will fly in defiance. And that, uh-huh. now that Nat Geo was just bought by Disney, like, why couldn't we? Um, but... Um, the Makes you like legal free solo legal couldn't wouldn't let us do it, and I mean, then ultimately, I think that free solo solved a lot of problems for us, like narrative uh, problems. Like it was still an elusive concept for everybody. What is free solo? So we yeah. just called the movie free uh-huh. solos, and suddenly, like all the problems went away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And now I can't imagine it, imagine yeah. it being called anything else. Yeah, um, yeah. Like I said, extraordinary accomplishment. It's it's funny. It's riveting. It's harrowing. It's beautiful. I saw Brett Morgan tweeted that you should be getting a, a cinematography Oscar for it, which is high praise from a, a master documentary filmmaker. I think all that praise is well earned. Um, it's super cool and exciting to see the response that the film is getting. I think it's only going to continue to build. And the beautiful thing about documentaries is they 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 get that opportunity to build and find their audience and. Um, this has got to be, it's a great time for you guys. It's so cool. So I'm excited for you. I look forward to seeing you on the stage at the Oscars. <laughs> we'll see. Fingers crossed. Step by step. Hey, man, I had Brian Fogel in here last year around this time. So anything is possible. Um, and uh, for those that are listening who haven't seen it yet, please make a point of, of, of seeing it. Um, and you will, you will uh, not be disappointed. Cool. Is there? Is there? Uh, is it everywhere nationwide right now? Mm-hmm. Yes. And what about internationally? It is opening in England December fourteenth, and more more countries to follow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but cool. it is at its widest this weekend. It's in four hundred theaters, so people should go out and see it. Yeah, and if people want to learn, if this is brand new to people, and they want to learn more about it, where's the best place for them to go online? Uh, freesolofilm dot com. Uh huh. Cool. And yeah. anything else coming up? You guys doing talks or? Anything like that where people can find you and track you down and stalk uh, you? Our Instagrams. Yeah. I'm at Jimmy underscore Chin. And I looked for years, but you didn't have any posts unless I had it wrong. No, she's just <laughs> you changed just joined? Oh, no, you no, changed no. it. I, I, everyone has convinced me to, go, to change it from like the name that used to make me happy to my own name. Uh-huh. So it's Chai Vassarelli. Okay. At Chai Vassarelli. At Chai Vassarelli. Yeah. Cool. And I'll put links to all that yeah. stuff up in the and show And free notes. solo film. There you so. go. All right, cool. Thanks, you guys. Thank Thank you. you. Peace.